firstborn among many brethren. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified.
Good morning, church. Have a bl uh, blessed Sunday. And for those who are tuning in online, it's good to see you. Um, it's good to be back in the house of God, isn't it? And so as we come together, as we um, come together to the house of the Lord, um, shall we all arise and, and um, focus our eyes on Him? And so today, some of us may be feeling all pumped up, saying like, hey, yeah, today's the Lord, the day of the Lord. But so for some of us, it may be like, yeah, today is the house of the Lord. But who knows we can be honest when we come before Him. Um, because as I was preparing uh, myself this morning uh, before I came, I was reminded about a passage from uh, the Bible in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. So it says here that, that this was about how King Je Jehoshaphat was faced with a great multitude of enemies that were um, trying to attack his him and, and, and his country. And so, and so he said, and, and this was God's response to him. So when Jehoshaphat was faced with all of these enemies and the multitude uh, that was faced um, towards him, he was fearful. So he went to the Lord, right? And so this was God's response to him. King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. So today, some of us may be battling through certain multitudes that is trying to clog your mind, trying to, 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 to tell you that you're not good enough. It can be a lie. It, you have been possibly hurt in the past that have affected how you love again or how you, that has made you turn inward and make you feel angry about people and you don't know how to trust. You don't know how to love. Or, or it could be a, a decisions that you're about to make in the midst of uncertainties that you're going through right now. For some of us, it may be a season of uncertainties and making the right decisions. For some of us, it's probably going through a relationship problem, a divorce maybe. But God is trying to tell you that the vast enemy that you are facing, the battle is not yours but God's. So in the next verse, um, what happened with the people and what King Jehoshaphat did, he said, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for the splendor of His holiness as they went out at, at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for His, loves, for His love endures forever. So as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and the enemy were defeated. So this is how we will face our battles today. We will face our battles by singing, by praising in the midst, in the presence of our enemies. Not at the end of it, in the beginning. Because when we worship, it's fellowship with Him. When we worship, it's communion. When we fellowship, it's like a transfer of trust that we're not in control, that we're not fighting our own battles, but God is. So as we sing today, let us declare it over our lives. Let us worship knowing that God is in control. Amen. Thank you. 
believe it, church. Sing like the battle has already been won. A race of hallelujah. With everything inside of me. Yes, Lord, we will declare it over our lives right now. A race of hallelujah. I will watch the darkness. Christians, not without, we're Christians with no, we're not Christians without any problems. Like, I would say that in every situation, in every season of our life, there will be decisions that we have to make, choices that we have to make, circumstances that we have to face, and there will always be problems, but what we find ourselves in uh, is of utmost importance. But today, we are so privileged, we're so honored, we're so humbled at the same time that our firm foundation found in Jesus Christ alone. Because he had already won and his victory is shared with all of us. So today, Christ is our firm foundation.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, with everything around me shaking. I've never been more glad, cause I put my trade in. generations so why would he fail now he won't he won't and I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense and I won't be Today, what we're offering is just more than a song. It's more than a performance. The song we sing is the life that we live. So let, when we sing, if you don't know it, let the words that you say be your life, be your prayer, be your declaration. Because when Christ is your firm foundation, you're not shaken. And in every season that you're going through that you seem defeated, one of the lines here it says, when everything around me is shaken, it's not shaking, it's shaken. But for some of us, it can be a time when we are feeling defeated, when we feel like there's no hope, we feel like the end is here. But today, let us be reminded that when you put your firm foundation in Christ, you're not shaken.
that we did things or said things that did not deserve you, God. But Lord, we thank you that you have been so merciful, Lord. And so God, today we want to come before you once again, just the way that we are, in our brokenness, in our imperfections, oh Lord. That God, knowing that Lord, when you live inside of us, in every situation, there is hope. There is, it is Christ in us, the hope of glory, oh God. So God, we thank you, O oh Lord, that we are not alone, that we're not forsaken, that God, we thank you that you meet us at the forefront. You want to fight with us. So God, we surrender our lives, that we, that we, we want to declare it again, O oh God, that we want your name to be magnified in us. So God, that we will leave who we are in the past, in the past. But today, in this new day, your mercies are new, that your grace is sufficient, and that you live inside of us, oh God. So God, today we want to surrender. We want to, we want to surrender our lives to you once again. To tell you that, Lord, that we, we, we live for your great name, oh God. We live for the name of Jesus. That your name be glorified. Your name be lifted up in this place right now. And in our lives, in Jesus' name. Thousand 
tongues that left one cry then from north to south and east to west with you Christ be magnified oh yes So that we can be more like Christ, Lord. In everything that we do, 
in our families, in our relationship, in our workplace, oh God. That, Lord, that your name will be lifted up. That, you're, that we can be more Christ-like in the situations that we're in, oh God. With the people that you've put around us. Help us to love them the way you do. Help us to be merciful to the people around us, oh God. So God, just as how you've we've obtained mercy, we've obtained mercy, uh, uh, forgiveness from you, God, we want to be merciful. We want to love the people around us, oh God. So God, today, we want to continue to remind ourselves that you, we want to find ourselves in you, that you're worthy of our lives, oh God. You're worthy of our praise, and you're worthy of every song that we could sing. In Jesus' name. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
discouraged for we are not hurt because Jesus is our firm foundation and when we love like he does man we're strong because his love never fails and we are not one person one circumstances away from backsliding and from being hurt because his love is our firm foundation and so God we thank you Lord today that Lord that we are found in you God so God, we thank you, we give you praise. And Father, as we surrender our hearts, our lives, our future, our choices, our decisions, our sicknesses, our brokenness, our financial insecurity, our bills, so oh Lord, our relationship problems, God, we thank you that we are not shaken, God. We will still choose to worship. We will not worry, we will worship, God. So Father, we thank you because we know and Lord, the same Christ, the same Spirit who resurrected Christ, the exact same Spirit who is living in each and every single one of us. So God, this is where we draw our faith from. We draw our faith from who you are and what you've done. Not what we did and what we, or who we are, but, in, but what you've done and what, and what you've done at the cross and who you are, oh God. So Father, we surrender the second part of worship, the second part of the service into your hands, O oh Lord. God, we, our hearts are open. Lord, our hearts are open. Would you just come and speak to us, oh Lord. Purify our hearts, oh God. We want to see you today. Lord God, we thank you. Lord, we pray for anointing, a special anointing to, to pastor, oh God. That God, that you would just give him a revelation. That your spirit would just be upon him. That he will speak your word in truth. That you will speak forth your word in boldness and courage, oh God. And just declare and to break forth your, your, your truth in, in all our lives, oh Father. So God, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Good morning, church, and welcome to our Sunday worship. We praise the Lord for the praise and worship for the anointed uh, messages of the lyrics of the songs, and we praise God for what He's doing in our midst today. Amen. I am Daphne, your announcer today. For those who are online, we welcome you also. And if this is your first time joining us, please type I'm new in the comment section so that we can also connect with you and welcome you formally. So we would also like to welcome our newcomers today. We have two newcomers. So welcome Nancy Gan and Philip. Amen. Praise the Lord. Welcome. And we have Philip Yap Po. Welcome! Alright, so for our giving today, for our tithes and offerings, members may give via Do It Now, Direct Bank Transfer or Touch and Go with the details you see on your screen. And please do not forget to indicate the purpose of your giving, whether it is for tithes, for offerings or for pledges, for mission or church ministry. So non-members should not feel obligated to give as this is an expression of our gratitude for what God has blessed, has blessed us with. And so let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, today we thank you once again for your faithfulness. We praise you with the words from Psalm 103. We praise you with our inmost being. We praise your holy name. We don't forget all your benefits, for you forgive all our sins and heal all our diseases. 
You redeem our lives from the pit and crown us with love and compassion. You satisfy our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Thank you, Father. We declare that you are good and your love endures forever. We worship and honor you not only with songs, but also with our tithes and offerings. Bless our giving, Lord, and increase our resources so that we can give more. We pray that you continue to bless our church finances and projects for the expansion of your kingdom. Strengthen, uplift, and edify us with your word and message for us today through the sermon. We pray for a special anointing for our speaker today, Lord. And we pray that we will be strengthened and encouraged with your word. We also remember in prayer Pastor Mike, who is preaching today in Klang Harvest Church. We pray that you manifest in the church and all churches all over the world who are worshiping you now in such a way that everyone will be edified and blessed beyond our imagination. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us watch a video from our Praise Kids ministry. Hey Church, I'm Anthony from Praise Kids. Together with this wonderful Praise Kids family, we are so blessed to minister to kids both online and physical. The families who are in Singapore, JB and even the Philippines. 2021 was a year of trying new things and keeping it real simple by doing what you can during these thriving times. We want to thank all volunteers and parents that helped this ministry along the way. And they bring goodies for special events, sharing the love in times like these and doing what we are called to do, to serve. The team has grown in younger volunteers as well. Most have went for training in speaking and conducting various segments such as worship, games, and shop sharing. We are glad to see families continue to serve in worship by recording themselves and passing on the heart of worship to the next generation. It was an exciting year, but we still need more helpers in sharing the word to the younger ones. This year's aim is to reach out. We have been equipped with the word online and in church last year, and now it's time to live out by faith. It's time to share the goodness of God with friends as most are going to school physically. There is no greater time than now. And we want you to be part of this next generation seating movement. This ministry is not a babysitting place, but a place where we empower and grow the next generation to be rooted in the Lord. Come join Precious Crew in areas such as singing with the cool kids, having fun with exciting games, sharing short stories from the Bible and encounters we had with God to the next generation. The borders are open. What more the kingdom of God for the little ones? It's harvest season. See you in Praise Kids. Amen. Praise the Lord for what He's doing in Praise Kids. It keeps growing and growing. And so we need more volunteers. If you are willing, uh, please uh, contact um, anyone from our church. Okay, so now let's go to a college camp announcement. College camp is taking place on the 9th to 11th of July in Malacca, and this is for 16 years old and above. And the theme is Rise Up. Now the cost is only 100 ringgit, which includes transportation, accommodation for three days, including meals. Okay, so that's really uh, really awesome for only 100 ringgit. So we invite all the, the college students to join. And uh, if you want to uh, get more details, you can contact uh, Crystal, Sister Crystal, and Esther. Next, uh, let me invite a brother Andy, who is going to discuss about a new ministry called Marketplace Impact Makers. Thank you, Sister Daphne. Right, uh, my name is Andy. I will making uh, sharing a bit more about this marketplace. Yeah, uh, just a quick one. Just now we were sharing the college one. You no, know, they, they have to pay hundred dollars, right? Uh, for those of those who college who want to join, maybe have some challenges. Don't worry, look out for us. We will sure be able to help you, right? Because uh, because the last time I shared this, uh, Sister Elaine said I spoil market because mine is free. 
hers must pay hundred dollars. But because of that, actually someone said, hey, we, we can pay for some of the students. So, so the students, if you feel like you, you need some help financially, don't, don't deprive yourself of the opportunity to join the camp. Please join the camp. Huh? Okay, back to what I was supposed to do. Huh? Okay, marketplace ministry. Last week, I came to share that we want to start this marketplace uh, ministry. And uh, I got some responses on some people and uh, they, say, they say, yeah, it's about time we should have this. So it starts our confirmation, right? That we need to do something for the marketplace. So I'm going to call out for all those who are Christian business owners or if you don't own a business but you have a position of influence in your organisation, please join us. Or even if you're aspiring, please join us because we want to start this uh, ministry where we can... We don't know how to do it yet. Okay, so that's why we're going to have this session. We had the vision. But let's have this vision, uh, session. Let's discuss what we want to do or what we can do. And let God take us on this mega adventure, right? So do join us for this uh, next Saturday morning. Register me so I need to know uh, how many people to provide food. Right, it's free. Remember, food is free. <laughs> uh, it's not free, it's sponsored, okay? But uh, if you need to register, please go to www.marketplaceimpactmakers.org. Right. And that's it. Any question, you have my phone number. Then my name is Andy. Just you can contact me. All right, with that, thank you for the announcement. I'll hand you back to Sister Daphne. Thank you, Brother Andy. Now for cell groups, we praise the Lord for our strong and dynamic cell groups, whereby we're encouraged and strengthened in our fellowship. Yesterday, the Filipino groups, we combined two cell groups last night. And yeah, it was a blessed time together. And we enjoy seeing each other online, even though we always see each other on Sundays, physically, face to face, but still we enjoy um, fellowshipping with one another via online. And it was indeed a blessed time together. So if you also would like to be blessed through the cell groups, you may join our cell groups. Um, you can go to our website and yeah, get details from our website. And I believe some of you may already be uh, meeting in person. Yes, and you may continue to do so and have a blessed time together. So for our prayer requests, we thank you for allowing us to pray for you and to journey with you through prayers. And a lot are experiencing breakthrough um, through the prayers with the help of our prayer warriors, including me. I am actually a recipient of God's blessings. God answered my prayers because of the leader's prayers for my prayer request, and I praise the Lord for that. So if you also have a prayer request, the number on your screen, there you may contact that, and rest assured that your prayer requests are kept private and confidential. For our Good Fridays, oh no, not Good Fridays, for <laughs> last, last Saturday's recap, yeah. Um, the, uh, Pastor Mike uh, preached about worship now. Yeah, so he he pointed out three things. Yeah, he said that worship is a priority, not just a scheduled event or on weekends. Yes, that's right. And worship centers on the person of God. Worship centers on His presence, and we forget our worries when we worship. Yes, Amen. And we when we worship, it brings divine possibilities like guidance from the Lord, direction and deliverance from our troubles and the way we worship is a reflection of our love for christ and our salvation from eternal death is the main reason why we are to worship god amen that simple fact is uh, enough for us to worship the lord right having eternal life in heaven is yeah more than enough to give praise to god and words are not enough songs are not enough to express how grateful we are to the Lord. And now let us be blessed once again for God's message to us this uh, morning and let us prepare our hearts as we listen to our speaker. Our speaker serves as the Executive Director of Asia CMS, a trans-denominational missions agency with activities currently focused on nations in Southeast, in South Asia and Southeast, yeah, Southeast Asia. He also serves as adjunct faculty for seminaries in Malaysia, Singapore, and internationally. His PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary focuses on missions and leadership in cross-cultural situations. He has been in full-time ministry for 40 years, serving in the past as a cross-cultural church planter, 
senior pastor and national leader with the Assemblies of God. He is married to True Me Lin, and I believe she's here with us also. Yes, you are blessed with her presence as well. And they have two grown up sons. And let's welcome Reverend Dr. Chan Nam Chen. Thank you, Daphne. Good morning. Well, I am glad to be here, and I hope you are glad to be here too. Uh, simply because uh, God is here. And it's always a privilege to be able to worship God. And all the more, oh wow, after uh, nearly two years of basically online, it's really a joy to be back. Yeah, it's, it's really a joy to be back. Now, uh, before I share the word of God with you, uh, first I want to say thank you to your pastor. And also thank you for the leadership of this church. And also this church, uh, COP actually has been... Uh, one of the regular supporters of Asia CMS, the, uh, the agency that I lead uh, and also I serve. Uh, so before I share with you the Word of God, uh, just, just to give a little bit uh, of info, uh, we also have a video that tells you about what Asia CMS is about. And if you want to, you can actually check out our website later. Of course, our website doesn't tell you everything. Uh, can we have the video? Connect, collaborate, catalyze. Walking alongside mission workers, Christian organizations, God's churches, and beyond, together on the edge in God's mission. This is Asia CMS. We are a trans-denominational mission movement based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Asia CMS was established in 2012 and currently the Asia CMS family has co-mission partners serving in Cambodia, India, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Thailand and Vietnam. They work in spheres of mission that include theological education, capacity building, peace and reconciliation, drug rehabilitation, human trafficking, refugee support, children's ministry, church planting, leadership and missional training, counseling and community development. We are associated with the rich history of the Church Mission Society, CMS, in the UK. Their story began over 200 years ago with a group of Christians whose hearts were stirred to put their call into action. This group included William Wilberforce and John Newton, who founded a society with the purpose of sending missionaries to Africa and the East. We are building on a 200-year-old legacy from CMS Britain. Asia CMS is about God's mission in Asia and from Asia to the rest of the world. It is Asians serving together with churches and Christians everywhere. We seek to engage the unreached and least rich people groups. We seek to engage in spheres of mission critical for national context, spheres that are often under-engaged or just simply overlooked. We seek to catalyze fresh thinking on questions raised by Asian churches, answered by Asian Christians. The Asia CMS family is a sacred space for mission workers, churches and organizations to connect, collaborate and catalyze new initiatives, new movements that further God's mission in Asia. Asia CMS endeavors to add to the efforts of churches, mission leaders and workers by facilitating seminars, webinars, training programs and mission education from introductory to postgraduate levels. We welcome you to come partner and walk with us as we journey alongside others together on the edge in God's mission. Okay. Now, that, that's, a, that, that's just a, a brief intro. We can't, uh, uh, simply because of time constraints and uh, limitations. We, but uh, if you want to know more, just check into our website. And of course, you can always uh, talk to me uh, personally. And again, thank you to the church and especially to your missions committee uh, for, uh, for supporting us. 
Now, uh, let's move to the Word of God. Now, this morning, I want to, uh, I want to talk about finding God in our stress and discouragement and sometimes uh, even depression, okay? And what I want to do today is this. I want to uh, draw lessons from the life of the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. And let, let me just share with you uh, what, what is my goal or what is my purpose in sharing this uh, topic. I think the last two years has been very tough years uh, for a lot of people and for churches. So number one, uh, this message is really dedicated to all of us here who have gone through a rough time, uh, a stressful time. And uh, even though now we are in the endemic stage, uh, the, the situation is a little bit easier, but a lot of the challenges, uh, we, are, we are still not too sure of what, what is ahead, okay? But secondly, this message is also especially dedicated for every single one of you here who have been serving the Lord faithfully, and in your heart, you have really been praying and you have been so desirous of seeing people turning to the Lord and seeing the, uh, the kingdom of God grow and advancing the kingdom of God. But at times, the, the results have not turned out the way that you wanted to turn out. Okay? Now, the third category that I'm really dedicating this to, it's really uh, for some of our co-mission partners of Asia CMS in different countries, uh, uh, especially in South Asia, Nepal and India, they will be, they will be watching this on, online later. You know, because the, uh, let me say that the real biggest heroes in God's kingdom today are not people like myself, okay? The real heroes and the real people that are, uh, that are advancing the kingdom of God are those people on the ground. Because... Uh, especially over the last two years, they are the ones that are, uh, are working very hard at the peak of the pandemic just simply to, to serve where, where it is needed, okay? Passing on the uh, uh, food packages, passing on the need exactly where they need it. And you know, last year, especially in, over the period of uh, between March until the end of the year, it was particularly tough for some of our, of our mission partners and pastors in the Nepal, in India, at the very peak, simply because that was when the, the, the pandemic hit and the, uh, the hospital medical facilities were overwhelmed. They could not cope. And not only were the people suffering, what happened was this. Pastors and top mission leaders were dying. And could you imagine that money wasn't enough and the church lose their pastors and mission leaders were dying? And worse, what was worse was this. Their families were left behind uh, simply without a main breadwinner. And yet the needs on the field were still there. And last year what we do was over that period, we... We try to raise up money, whatever we could, simply to support some of these uh, people that we are not even directly engaged with uh, just over a couple of months because it was so incredibly tough for many of them. And of course, right now, it seems it's a little bit easier, but yet the stress and, the, uh, and sometimes the discouragement actually carries on. And so this message is really specifically uh, dedicated uh, to them. And... As we begin to look into 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 to 18, there are going to be some very important lessons that we are going to be able to draw. And I believe it's going to benefit all of us here. And for some that's going to be catching this online, even now or later, I, I also believe that God is going to speak to you. So before we carry on, let's just have a word of prayer. Father, I pray that right now as I begin to open up, oh God, the key ideas from this passage, I pray that your mighty Holy Spirit would take it and bring the different parts of it to the parts of our life where we need to hear from you and may cause, O oh Lord, light to shine in the darkest recesses of our heart and our minds. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Now, I want to start off by saying that deep spiritual experiences with God, even deep spirituality, even experiences of hearing God powerfully and seeing the miracles of God does not always exempt us from stress, from discouragement, or as in the case of Elijah, from a bout of depression. Because the prophet Elijah, even before we go into the passage, was one of the two most prominent prophets in the Old Testament alongside Moses. He was a man used of God in the supernatural, and he was a man that was very much accustomed to the miraculous. And in the New Testament, John the Baptist is said to come in the spirit and the power of Elijah, fulfilling a prophecy in Malachi chapter 4, where it says that, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the day of the Lord. And in that sense, it is the spirit of Elijah that he will turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the hearts of children to their fathers. And then in Matthew chapter 17, verse 3 to verse 4, Elijah, alongside with Moses, appeared. He was that two key pers uh, persona from the Old Testament that appeared to Jesus at the transfiguration. And then in Revelation chapter 11, the names are not mentioned, but many Bible commentators believe that the two witnesses that is going to appear at that time is going to be Moses and Elijah. So, Moses, uh, so Elijah is an incredible, uh, incredibly prominent person from the Old Testament. But even before we go into 1 Kings chapter 19, I think to actually uh, more fully appreciate it, we got to understand the backdrop of the story, okay? The backdrop of the story, because and you see that uh, starting from uh, chapter 17. Because that era or that period can be described as a time or a season of great spiritual darkness and backsliding, uh, in Israel, simply because it was under the rulership of King Ahab and, uh, and of his more infamous wife by the name of Jezebel. I know that some of you may not remember the name Ahab, but I think all of us remember the name uh, of Jezebel. Okay? And 1 Kings chapter 17, 18, and 19 actually is a narration of a three year, not one week, two week, three week, three months but a three-year spiritual battle that starts from chapter 17 where Elijah prophesies as the judgment of God a three-year drought. There's not going to be a drop of rain over the next three years simply because uh, it was part of God's plan to turn the people back to Him. But how many of you know that every time when you are in a negative situation like this, even if it's God's judgment, it is not only the, uh, the unbelievers or the unrepentant that suffer. That drought also affects everybody else, including Elijah. And that was why over the three years, he, uh, he barely survived. And basically, he was fed uh, by a poor widow. Okay? He was not exactly staying in the Shangri-La or the Hilton, but it was a, a very, very tough period. And then, at the end of the three year. In chapter 18, there is a powerful story where Elijah confronts Ahab and after that had a showdown with the false prophets, 450 prophets of Baal in a power encounter where Elijah says, Look, people, who are you going to serve? If Jehovah is God, you serve Him. If Baal is God, serve Him. But let's see who is real. And he gave a challenge where they set up two altars, one to Baal and one to Jehovah, and they uh, laid bullocks or, you know, uh, sacrifices, animal sacrifices on. And he says, okay, if Baal is true, call to your God if he's alive to come and consume the sacrifice. And of course, for the whole day, the Baal did, uh, prophets did everything, nothing happened. And then, 
Elijah just spoke the word and zap. Fire came down from heaven and essentially consumed the sacrifice uh, that was offered to Jehovah. You know how I wish I could be there to actually observe it? Okay, it, it's, it's, like a, it's like a movie script, you know? Okay, the only thing is it's not a movie script. It's real. And essentially proving to King Ahab and those who are on looking that Jehovah is the true and living God. It was an incredibly dramatic encounter. And sure enough, the people looking on just turned to God. Okay? And they killed and they removed the prophets of Baal. And then the last couple of verses of chapter 18 talks about how Elijah brought the rain, uh, I mean brought the drought to an end where he prayed and out of nowhere, the heavens just opened up and it rained like crazy uh, after three years of drought. Now, what happened was this. It was an incredibly great victory that Elijah was expecting will turn the tide. That after this, surely the nation will turn to God. But let's see what happened in chapter 19. Uh, please help me with the verses, okay? In 1 Kings chapter 19, I want us to read, uh, I just want you all to follow the story. Uh, if it's not big enough, please check it out with your telephone. The Bible here tells me that Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, and this is so completely unexpected, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Now, Elijah was expecting Jezebel that after all that happened, the sheer demonstration of power, she was going to back off. But instead, she passed a message. So shall it be unto me that by the time tomorrow, you are going to end up as one of those that you kill. Okay? <laughs> Completely unexpected. And then the Bible tells me in verse 3, Elijah, something happened inside of him. Maybe it was simply the stress of the incredible, you know, because when you've gone through something that's so dramatic, uh, and all of you know that, you know, when you're doing a major project, after everything is over, something inside of you, uh, emotionally you're not as strong as you, uh, as you want to be. The Bible says that then he was afraid and he rose and he ran for his life. And he came to Bathsheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, Jezebel's heart response was not expected by Elijah. And this is a reality that some of us will face, that sometimes great fear and deep discouragement can surface after a great victory when we expend a lot of physical, emotional, and I will even add spiritual energy. Okay? It is like, what happens like, you know, uh, you are in this uh, World Cup and it's the final and at the end of 90 minutes, it's still a draw. So you got to play an extra how many minutes? Huh? 30 minutes. And then after, at the end of 30 minutes, it's still a draw. Then you go for your penalty shootout and finally you win and everything goes, yay! But after that, they say, uh, you got to play an extra 90 minutes. Now, I, I think, I think it is it's something similar to that. And that was what happened. He broke. But then the story tells us that it, from verse 4, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came down and he sat under a broom tree and he asked that he might die. He asked that he might die. Can you just imagine just a couple of days after the huge victory, he simply saying that, I want to die. But of course, which at the back of my mind asked me, hey, if you want to die, why run? Nah? Just let her kill you lah. <laughs> okay? Uh, but actually, he doesn't want to die. But he's just expressing uh, he was really despondent. He simply said, it is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. I say, I, 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 now, he is not revealing everything. But he, I think it's a sense of, God, I've tried so hard. I did everything I could. And now, 
what is the whole point? I don't know whether some of you ever feel like that before, but I have, okay? I have, and I know that a lot of men, of, men and women of God have. And that was the situation. And then in verse 5, it says, He laid down, uh, he laid down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Uh, and he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he rose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, or modern day what we refer to as Mount Sinai in the, uh, in the uh, what you call it, the Arab Peninsula, the Mount of God. Now I want you to note also that all this time, uh, I believe he was praying, seeking God, but God never answered. Okay, uh, God just held, uh, God never asked uh, answered the wise, but just ask him through the angel, just make your way. And you know, uh, one of the reasons why I gave the title "Finding God in Our Stress" is because this is a situation where people. This person is praying. He is seeking God, but he has yet to find an answer. It is not talking about a person that doesn't bother to pray. It's not about talking about a person that couldn't be bothered about who God is, but it's talking about a person who's still praying, who's still finding God, but yet stressed out, yet discouraged. And in the case of Elijah, uh, in a place actually of depression. But here is where in the following passages, I mean in the following verses, God speaks to Elijah. And after that entire long 40-day hike, now I know that right nowadays uh, hiking is in the vogue. Uh, uh, people do hiking one day, hikes, three hour hike, six hour hikes. And then it's also a holiday business in places like Nepal or Bhutan where you know, uh, I visit some of these places where you have Koreans, you have people from overseas. Uh, they will book in for a two-week hike across the mountain of Himalayas. But in this case, it's not a two-week hike. It's a 40-day hike <laughs> to, to reach that mountain. And finally, the Bible here says in verse 9, uh, uh, can, can we switch it? Verse 9, it says, He came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah responded, God, I've been very jealous for the Lord, for you, the God of hosts. The people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, I'm left. And they seek my life to take it away. Now, that was what he really felt. He felt that after doing everything, trying to turn the heart of the nation toward God, trying to turn the heart of people toward God, he is the only one that's left, the only one that's really faithful to God. And then God spoke. Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And what happened? Very powerful here. The Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces uh, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, the sound of a loud whisper. And then... When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, went out, stood at the entrance of the cave, and behold, a voice came to him. That voice is the voice of God. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah repeated the same answer. I've been jealous for the Lord. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. But the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Okay, he is repeating the same thing. And then the Lord doesn't answer him. He says, here's what I want you to do. You know, uh, sometimes it's pretty amazing and interesting and probably it's also true for us. Very often, God doesn't answer the why, the why to our question immediately. But God was just telling him, here's what I want you to do. Go return your way to the wilderness of Damascus and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. 
And Elisha, the son of Shaphath of Abel, Mehola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel, Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every, every mouth that has not kissed him. Now, here is where, over the next 10 minutes, I just want to draw very quickly four key lessons that we can see. Now, I've already laid for you the context of what they were going through. But there are actually some very important lessons that we can see in this story. Number one, finding God in our stress and our discouragement is actually not so much about us finding God. I'm contradicting myself here. But it's really about God's grace finding us. Because, you know, when you look at that whole story, and when I first read it, my first impression is that here is a person so intent on finding God who seemed to be silent and who seemed to be far away. But then when you begin to look at the story from the beginning and you see the end, you realize that all of it was orchestrated by God. That you cannot really understand the beginning until you see the end. That it is God orchestrating the events and God in His kindness, at the end of it, ministering to His very faithful prophet, but a very tired and discouraged prophet. And it is simply God saying that, Elijah, you might feel discouraged. You might feel a failure that you've done whatever you could and you've gone to the maximum and you're kind of feeling despondent, that you're feeling useless, but it's simply God, Jehovah, coming down and saying that at the end of the story that you might be finding me, but actually, I'm there all the time. And finding God in our stress, in discouragement, it's really at the end of the story when we understand the perspective, it is actually God's grace finding us, reaching us, touching us where we are. Amen? That in the midst of all that He was going through, in the midst of all that you are going through, God is simply, simply wants us to know that He cares for you and whatever you have felt, He has actually never left you. You might feel that He's so far away. You might feel that the objectives, the spiritual objectives that you are so longing for, is unachieved, but God is simply saying, no, you're right there and I'm right there all the time for you. Now, the second thing that I notice about this story is how intensely practical God is. is uh, this is found in chapter 19, verse 6 to 7, where very often part of the answers in dealing with stress and discouragement, how many of you know that this is so spiritual? It's simply good sleep and food. <laughs> okay? Now you find that in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 5 and 7, after he came to the end and says, God, I am the only one. And then he lay down and he slept. And after he woke up, uh, I mean the, the angel touched him and he says, Arise and eat. And behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Now, if he's Malaysian, uh, it, might, it might read that at his head there was a good plate of nasi lemak with a uh, uh, fried, fried drumstick, a fried chicken, a piece of chicken thrown in, and a nice cool jar of coconut water. Okay? And then the angel of the Lord came to him again and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. I don't know what was there on the second meal. Ah. <laughs> okay? And you see, sometimes a 
a part of our stress and discouragement and even depression is actually due to natural causes. It's simply not enough sleep. And the answer is just sleep. And lack of certain nutrition, uh, lack of uh, certain chemicals within your body, and you just, you just got uh, to fill it up, okay? And you know, uh, even as I'm, I'm getting older, and I assume that all, uh, there are some here, uh, some remain forever young. Uh, but those who are getting older, uh, one of the things that we do realize is that uh, when, we, when we are physically inactive, it actually affects us emotionally. Okay? Of course, when you've done your research, you realize that when you do certain exercises, you do certain things, it releases certain chemicals and hormones within your body. And your, your mood uh, is actually affected uh, by what you eat, what, what you do. And that is why I think there's also a second application when you're dealing with stress and discouragement. Uh, don't over-spiritualize everything. Uh, don't, don't blame the devil all the time. Uh, don't blame your pastor all the time either, that his, uh, his, uh, his prayers or your leaders are not, not powerful enough. Uh, sometimes there are just some very, very uh, natural causes. Okay? And you know, that's why when I look at this passage, to me it is so practical, at the same time, so powerful. But the third thing that I see in this is that God's word to us very often is not through the spectacular, sorry, let's move it back, let's, let's focus on the third point. Is very often not in the spectacular, but in the gentleness of his still small voice. Now, you find that in verse 9 to verse 13, where finally after the 40 day hike, God asked him to come up, and he was in the cave. And he went out and stand uh, on the mount before the Lord. And then the Bible says, The Lord passed by. And then there was a strong and powerful wind that actually shook the mountains. And the Bible says, says broke in pieces uh, the, uh, the rocks before the Lord. But then it says, the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an equally dramatic earthquake. But the Bible says, the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after that, the earthquake, a fire. But again, the word of God says, the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, the sound of a low, of a low whisper, a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he just knew. God is there. And the Bible tells me that he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave listening to God. Now, and here is the point for all of us, is that sometimes we are looking to hear God speaking in the dramatic and the spectacular. And sometimes we are expecting to hear from that prophet. Sometimes we are expecting to see something dramatic happen. And I want to suggest that maybe one reason why Elijah had to, I mean God had to Elijah so far away from where the drama is, where the action is, into the loneliness of the desert, into the loneliness of Mount Sinai, is that just to remove the multiple voices of the peoples, of the drama, so that Elijah could hear him. And maybe for all of us here, we need to train ourselves to hear God in the routine and in the mundane rather than in the special occasion. How many of you know that God could be just speaking to you while you're stressed out but, and you're in your car driving in the midst of the traffic jam and just wondering, and that is where God speaks, in the still small voice, inside your heart. Inside your heart. And here is something I discover again and again and again that sometimes Christians are so busy with so many things, with the dramatic, that unless they stop and they still their heart, they can't hear God. But that is when God speaks in that still, small voice. Now the fourth lesson that I want to bring out today that comes out 
in this story is that God wills that we transit to a new place of faith when we see reality through God's eyes. Now you see this from verse 15 to verse 18. You realize that Elijah loved God passionately, but because of the tragedy of what happened, this was going on in his mind where he kept on saying, repeated the same, uh, the same series of, uh, of ideas two times. God, I've been very jealous for you, the, uh, the Lord, the God of hosts, but the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. they thrown down your altars. They killed your prophets with a sword. And I, even I, oh God, I am the only one left. Now, God did not immediately answer to him. God first told, uh, gave him some instruction uh, to anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, Jehu over Israel, and anoint uh, his successor, the prophet Eli Elisha. And then the Lord explained in verse 18 that Elijah, much as you have heard me, much as you have been so zealous for me, much as you have honoured me, your perception is not 100% accurate. You think you are the only one that's faithful. That's not true. Verse 18, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And I think uh, what happened to Elijah when he heard that was, he kind of went, you know what I mean? And I think he's going to say, sorry, God. You see, there's, there's a tendency for some of us here, especially when we are very passionate for God. You want things to happen. But then when things doesn't happen, and then some of the responses has not been so positive, there's a tendency to have that. I will refer to this as the Elijah complex. God, I am the only one. I am the only true believer. Everybody else have compromised. I am the only one. And Christian leaders sometimes have a tendency to have this kind of a Elijah complex. And here is where it encourages us that very often our understanding deceives us. Things are never as bad as it looks. Of course, uh, not as good as it appears to also at times. Okay? But when we recalibrate and we see reality as it actually is through God's eyes, that is where we come to a new place of faith. Now, I'm very shortly going to bring this message to a close. This is where I want to speak this as an encouragement to all of us. First, if you are in a place of stress, I want you to know, and here is where I want you to recommit yourself and say, God, I may not understand it all, but I know that you're here for me. Amen? But really this passage is really speaking for all, especially who are really trying your best to serve God and doing your best to advance the kingdom of God and things doesn't appear uh, to be advancing the way you want it to. And this is my encouragement to you. Like uh, Elijah, recognize that God, I, don't, I can't see everything. And the reality is this, there are still another 7,000. That I may not see it, it may not even happen in my circle, but I know and I believe that your kingdom is advancing. And let me just very quickly just share a quick testimony. You know, the pandemic was a very, very tough period. But that was also the time as I received news from different places. People simply turning uh, to the Lord. One of our partners in Indonesia, they were serving among the poor. Uh, but yet in the midst of all of that, they managed to complete a community center, uh, which uh, we helped to sponsor a little bit. Most of the money actually came from Singapore. But a couple of weeks ago, when they dedicated that building, uh, turnout wasn't very big. They were only expecting 100, but 150 turned up. But yet in that process, 
uh, there were at least, now I can't remember exactly, it's either four or five, but four to five individuals received Jesus. That even in the midst of what we think are negative circumstances, people are turning to the Lord. Amen? It may not be in the way that you turn out, uh, that you think should turn out. It may not be where you expect it to appear. But here is where I want to encourage all of us. Our God is on the throne and He is working. Amen? Amen. His glory is still marching on. And right now, as we come into the presence, uh, come Brother Joseph, come and lead us. And let's just worship the Lord and let's come into the presence of, of God. Shall we just arise to our feet right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Karamandala Bashandai. Now, even before uh, Joseph, is it? Uh, Brother Joseph and the team leaders who worship, I want to lead us in prayer. Now, if you are in a place of discouragement, or even if you're not in a place of discouragement, you're kind of in a place of apathy. God, what in the world are you doing? I want you to know that even as you're challenged today, and you realize that God is alive and God is working, and you're hearing the sound of my voice, and you are saying in your heart, God, I want to give my life to you anew. And I want to place my faith in you. And I want to be positive about what I'm doing. And I want to be serving you. Now, if this is what God is saying to you right now, whether you are uh, watching it online, but especially for those of you who are here, could you just lift up your hand to the Lord? Lift up your hand to the Lord and say, God, I want to trust you. I want to believe you. All over. Yes, just go ahead. Go ahead and lift up your hand because I am going to pray and we are trusting that God is going to touch our hearts and touch our future. Amen. Amen. Father, I want to thank you, God, for every, every single heart and every single hand right now lifted to you. Father, where they have been in a place of faithlessness, apathy, or even discouragement, oh Lord, even as they lift their hands to you, most of all, they are lifting their hearts to you. And where they are saying in their hearts, in their minds, God, here I am. I believe you. I trust you. I will rise like Elijah and I will do what you have me to do with the rest of my life, with what I have. Father, as, even as, I say, as they are saying this right now, I ask for the Holy Spirit to come and seal that prayer and touch and give a new release of strength and anointing. Hallelujah. Right now, I want to ask everybody just to lift up your hand. I want to pray a general prayer for all. Father, I want to pray, God, for this entire congregation, for this church. Father, I pray that as this church right now open up, it shall be moving into a new season. A new season, God, of fruitfulness. A new season of obedience. A new season, Lord, of seeing your favor in the different things that they attempt to do, especially the things that they do to bless the community, the things that they do to see men and women, young and old, to see their hearts turn to Jesus. Father, I thank you. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just take a bit of time, just worship the Lord. Brother Joseph, take us on. Praise the Lord. to fix our eyes on Him that matters. There might be thousands of things that's trying to grab our attention, but today our attention is on Him. So as we sing this last song, we declare over our lives that Jesus is worthy of every song that we sing. That He's worthy of every breath that we could ever breathe. 
And so we, we ready to rededicate our lives and tell him that we live for him. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever give. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Begin to lift your voice. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Oh. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me With your heart and lead me In your love to those around me Oh yes, oh Lord, we worship you this day Sing Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name. Oh, Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one. None beside you open up my eyes and wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Oh yes, oh God, we will build our firm foundation on you, Lord. Oh yes, oh God. So go alone and I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will build. 
discouraged for you are in me you are in us oh yes oh God church begin to lift your praise begin to tell how much you want to live for him reach out Lord reach out to him he is near to who pursues him he is near he's not far Lord he's not far guys he is not church he is not Holy Spirit just come and feel this praise place, oh God. Feel this presence, oh Lord. In the presence of our affliction. In the presence of our in the presence of our enemies, oh God, we will choose, oh Lord, to worship. We will choose to give you praise. We will choose to give you thanks. For our faith is found in you. Our firm foundation is found in you. Our confidence is come, is found in you, O oh Lord. So God, we thank you for the awesome, awesome sermon for us, the message you have for us, oh God. So Lord, I pray you continue to lead and guide us as we move forward in our lives, Lord, in the decisions that we're about to make, in the choices that we, 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 we are deciphering and holding on to you, Lord. We want to hold on, moving on, we want to hold on to you, God. We want to hold on to your word. We want to fight that good fight of faith, oh God, of believing who you say that we are. So Father, we just want to thank you and just um, bless every single one of us here today, oh God. The Lord, as we go forth in our separate life, individual lives, oh God, would you, we thank you that your goodness continues to pursue us, that your love continues to, 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 to chase us, oh God. And so Lord, we thank you for your protection. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your providence. We thank you that you are alive and well, and this is what we'll tell our soul, our soul, oh Lord, today. So God, we thank you, we praise you, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. We, we give you praise. Amen. Have a blessed week ahead, church. God bless.